Um, well, maybe I just would love to tell you the um, three of you just a little bit more too about the program. So about half of the folks that are here are hoping to get full time jobs in the next year or two. Mm -hmm. um, so about half the folks here are hoping to get farming in the next year or so. Um, some have access to land, some are looking for land, and um, we'll be supporting them with helping them with their leases and all of that. And then um, another half are just are interested in becoming designers and helping people design their own farms and landscapes. And so we have kind of a mixed group here today. And um, once they're done with this 13-week training, then they'll move into a mentorship and land access program where we help them with that. So it's kind of the context. Well, that's great. Yeah. Well, I guess um, I'll just plunge right in. Uh, welcome to all of you. and. Uh, this is exciting, and it's also the first time we've uh, worked with a group uh, of, of dedicated uh, future um, agriculturalists, farmers. Usually we have groups that come here that are preschool <laughs> and a little bit bigger, and we get them out in the dirt pulling weeds too, so, so we'll be sharing that with you. I, I thought it was kind of interesting or appropriate that we gather next to the, uh, the, the, the chicken yard uh, and and uh, with with thoughts of incubator farms, this seems completely relevant. And uh, you can ask the girls there. It's pretty easy to lay an egg, but uh, it's a little more difficult to go from a scramble to a souffle. So uh, I'm I'm sure that uh, with your uh, dedication and uh, uh, purposefulness with the school, that you'll be souffle. Bakers. <laughs> That's my hope. And then a uh, little bit about our vision and and how it might or might be might or might not be relevant to you. And then we're going to take off. So uh, uh, Susan, my wife, and I, and, and our family have been here on this property for 45 years now. Uh, we came at a time when the uh, the grape and wine industry was just beginning to wake up after the doldrums of Prohibition and then World War II. And uh, this area ultimately became a, a real, real focus for, for this, new, this new industry. Um, and that captured my fascination also. I spent a year at UC Davis studying viticulture and enology. And that put me on a certain path, which is completely different from the the path we're on now. Uh, after being here, uh, we, we have 125 acres altogether, and um, uh, at the beginning, my my goal was to plant everything to grapes, and then later on, it was to make wine from all that stuff. And I found myself uh, uh, spending most of my time on United Airlines, uh, flying around the country to peddle wine, and that's not farming. And so we, we came to our senses uh, maybe 15, 18 years ago and realized with the, with the beauty of this place and the potential of the soils and the, the, the incredible uh, the, the power and the creativity and the, uh, the health of this, this region, the, the Sonoma County, Russian River watershed, Dry Creek Valley, that there are many more productive things that we could do on this land. And uh, I've, I've, been, I've been called a lot of things in my life, but in recent times, uh, I, well, I refer to myself as a recovering uh, wine grower, and, uh, and, and happily so. There, there are many, many more worthwhile things to do than, than to focus on a monoculture. And so one, one of the things that I will talk about, uh, probably ad nauseum, uh, but I think you will re resonate to it, is about diversity. The last thing that, that we want to do for healthy farms is to pursue one crop. And um, so that, that's been kind of our, our, our siren call here at, at Preston to, um, to honor uh, the incredible wealth of diversity of this area and our soils and the things that we can do with it. Um, so, so here we find ourselves with uh, those same 125 acres of, of which half is still in grapes and the other half is in all kinds of stuff, pasture and orchard and annual crops. 
and hedgerows and riparian uh, uh, growth along the creeks and and chickens and sheep and pigs and everything. It's uh, it's a bit of a circus now, but it's a whole lot more fun than it used to be. So before we take off, I, I put together some notes on what what my vision is, and it's it's kind of a moving target in a way. It, 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 it's a very personal thing, how we feel about this land and the future of this land. So I'm going to pull a piece of paper out of my pocket and uh, read you some notes. And I, as we walk around, I'd like you to think about whether these things are relevant to you. So uh, my, my preamble here, th th this is a theoretical and conceptual approach to the future dedication of the lands that we're on right now, Preston Farm. Uh, dedication to a sustainable system of enterprise building and resource sharing. And, and that will become clearer to you as we walk around and as we talk further. It assumes the protection of the integrity of the land for the future as a resource, its dedication to agriculture, environmental balance, which you'll see as we walk around, community building, which not everybody talks about as part of our food system, and social justice, and that's another element that not everybody talks about. So, uh, just to list some of these things, the health of the land is based on things like crop rotation, natural soil building, and carbon sequestration. What does that mean? Well, we'll, we'll be going over and talking at our compost pile. That's an example of, of natural soil building. Protect biodiversity. It's, it's like going from that monoculture of grapes to a multiplicity of, of, of different crops and, and nature and uh, we, we're all familiar with, with uh, slow food. Slow food as a slogan or a manifesto. Uh, what we do in the farming industry or in our community should be, our food should be good, clean, and fair. And I don't usually use those words, but they're kind of underneath everything that we think and everything that we do. Good, healthy food, uh, a clean environment and, and fair to the people that are involved. It should be sustainable, financially sustainable. That's a hard nut to crack. We're working on very expensive land here, all of us. I think that's what faces us. Uh, access to, uh, to affordable land, uh, being able to raise crops that where uh, our customers our, our clients can afford it. Um, controlling our costs. Um, that's, a, that's a tough one too. Uh, another another um, mantra that I have is, uh, or, or a um, moniker, people look at what I'm doing and what we're doing here and they say, well, I'm a farmer. Actually, I'm a dreamer. Mm -hmm. I'm a dreamer that farms. And it's it's hard to pencil out dreams, mm -hmm. but you'll, you'll feel them as we walk around. Uh, building community. Uh, we, we've learned uh, as we develop our wine business here that we have an incredible following that really appreciates the diversity that they, that they see here. It's like we, we like to say they, they come for the wine and they stay for the bread and stay for the chickens and stay for the apple juice. and and for the walk around and the feeling, it feels like like grandmother's, grandma's farm. And maybe now it's my great grandmother, whatever. But there's, it's an experiential thing. Sharing what, what you do with farming is powerful. There are CSAs, we have a wine club, which we're beginning to move into a wine and food club. Um, educational programs, that, from our preschoolers up to you and, and beyond. Uh, sharing it through education is, in, in, is powerful. Um, collaboration with other people in the farming community. Uh, I, I'm sure you're all aware of the, the Farmers Guild, a uh, group of young people that want to learn by asking their neighbor, well, how do you do this? And do you have a, a plow I can borrow? And, and where do I get seed for whatever? 
a, a community is an incredible resource. So you're not farming alone. You're farming in, in a system of, of people. Um, as we talk about what could, what could be done uh, on, on this property, we're going to be uh, the, the incubator farm uh, laying eggs. Um, it's about shared resources. If, 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 we, if we developed incubator farms on this property, as an example, there's, there's uh, sources of nutrition, there's sources of water, the soil clear, clearly is a, a shared resource. Uh, helping each other is a, can be a shared resource. Uh, what's been important to us is that we we feel uh, an obligation to honor the history and the culture of this area. This is an old Italian neighborhood. Um, all of my neighbors uh, were were small family farmers. They didn't just grow grapes; they mostly grew orchards. And it was it was a prune. It was a, uh, one of the areas where, where prunes were really important after the war. And so um, that was part of their culture. But well, we've re reintroduce orchard trees to this property as, as part of our recognition that this is important to our, our, our culture. Yeah. Um, there, there's a holistic um, goal that it's very hard to describe, but the whole farm is interactive. It's, it's crops and animals and people and um, uh, the health of the soil developed in a natural way. You've got you've got the sheep, which we'll see later on, that that disturb the soil as they graze, they shit, and they move, and um, we think that's incredibly important. Uh, integrating animals into a, a farmscape, um, and we th we think that it, it's really important that the owner of a piece of land be the one that operates it. There's too many examples nowadays of, of especially vineyards that have been turned over to a contractor who's interacting with a corporate buyer, and you've got this cascade of, of, of rules of how to do things. Um, we think the, the, the creativity is it's, it's among you. Be yourself, be imaginative, try stuff, think outside the box, get to know your land on a personal level. You're the kind of people that will get off the tractor and feel the soil. Uh, there are too many people out there in the, in the farm world nowadays that never get off the tractor. So uh, the, the personal interactive aspect of farming is, in, is hugely important and we're in danger of losing it, uh, we as a society. So. That's my lecture. <laughs> That's it, I can put the paper away. <laughs> so the property, as Lou says, 125 acres, and it's uh, encircled by the red line. You guys all came in here. Here was that entrance, and there's the road. Right. See you later. And we're right here uh, by the winery complex, which is right over there. And so the dominant features, we're going to say, is Pena Creek, uh, uh -huh. a classic seasonal creek. Um, and Dry Creek, which is uh, fed by uh, uh, a reservoir up at the top of the valley. And so you can see, the, and we'll have lots of chance to look at these. We have a couple smaller copies of the map somewhere here we'll be carrying around with us. But we're going to take a walking tour and see um, a whole bunch of different parts of the farm. A little part, of, it's mostly flat, a little bit of a hill over there. And it's uh, it's got these uni the unique feature of the uh, creek around it. This is not part of the farm. If anybody wants to climb up on top, you're welcome. <laughs> That's what the young kids do. They, they'd be up here jumping around. <laughs> so um, a point that I like to make is. A truly sustainable farm is able to create its own nutrition. It's about cycling nutrients. Um, ideally, there would never be any waste. Um, everything ultimately ends up back in the land. Uh, we, we have been certified organic for oh, I don't know, 15 or more years, and we just got certified biodynamic last year, although we've been practicing uh, 
uh, practicing biodynamic. We've been doing biodynamic for, for a lot of years. And one of the precepts is just what I'm talking about. It's uh, um, avoiding external inputs as much as you can. Uh, the nutrition is, is, is your, your place expressing itself over again and over again. Now, how do we do that here? We, uh, we have a winery which uh, has pumice, uh, uh, grape skins, stems, etc. As a, as a byproduct, as waste. We make olive oil from our own olives and the pressing of the olives gives us a paste that goes into the compost pile. Uh, we have substantial orchards now. It began with planting um, olive trees before it became fashionable to do. <laughs> and, and then after, subsequent to that, we, we planted uh, an apple grove, and then we've been planting peaches and other, <coughs> other trees. When we prune our trees, we run it all through a chipper. And now we've got pasture, uh, pastures all over the place. Maybe, well, maybe 15 acres or so of, of our land is in pasture for our animals. And one of our challenges has been uh, striking a balance between animals and pasture. Too many animals, not enough pasture. Too much pasture, uh, it, 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 it's wasted. It, it, uh, it grows past maturity and the animals don't want it anymore. So one of the things that we've found uh, works positively for us, if there's too much pasture, we harvest the grass and it goes into the compost. You can see that big pile over there, that's grass. I got the idea from uh, uh, Googling around many, many years ago and found a farm uh, uh, in Georgia or someplace that intentionally grew sedan grass to feed their compost pile. Yeah. I'm thinking, well, this is kind of cool. Maybe so. we should try that. But anyway, we do. We have a machine. There it is right there. Uh, the fall, it's uh, an Italian uh, grass uh, uh, cutter collector thing. <laughs> We, we can have grass being in. <coughs> um, so, um, a compost pile is based strictly on vegetative uh, sources isn't complete. It needs animal matter. We don't have enough animals to provide that. So we do bring in, the one input that we bring into this place, the one significant input is manure from an organic dairy. And, and it's totally the wrong thing to do. We're, we're, we're using a lot of fossil fuel to haul cow shit from Santa Rosa to Dry Creek. Makes no sense at all. But uh, in, in our in our modern um, uh, community, society, whatever, there, there's no alternative right now. There are some dairies that are a little bit closer, but it's still a haul. If, if I had if I had my druthers and if I were young enough. I'd start a dairy, so we could produce our own cow shit. <laughs> but uh, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> That's something for you guys to do. So in, anyway, the, uh, the the idea here is it's, it's an integrated, self-contained, <coughs> cycling machine, this farm. And uh, it, uh, it it works for us, I would say, uh, quite well. Our, our uh, organic mentor, Amigo Bob, was he coming today? He was supposed to show up, so I still expect Ho Hopefully he'll be here. He's one of, the, one of the really important pioneers of California organic farming, as is Mr. Katz. Uh, and when, when we first retained Amigo and talked about going organic, he said, Lou, if you're going to farm organically, the first thing you need to do is buy as much compost as you can afford and put it everywhere. And I had been a, a, just a home gardener. And it was a lot of work just putting compost out in my backyard. And the thought of composting 125 <laughs> acres was awesome. But we started doing it. And, and it's really paid off. So nutrition, natural nutrition, local nutrition. Basically, we've got our own microflora, whatever, bacteria, the stuff that is the the guts of the farm, and we're we're re-inoculating our farm with our own um, yeah, organic yeah. matter. Yeah. Well, the conventional grape growers, how do they deal with fertility that's different from this? Uh, there, there are um, 
currently the, the, the rage is, and it's a legitimate one, to plant leguminous cover crops uh -huh. that will add nitrogen. Of course, nitrogen isn't, isn't a complete source of nutrition, yeah. but it's a good start. In the old days, you would buy sacks of uh, ammonium nitrate or yeah. whatever and put, and put it out. And the, the University of California had a formula and uh, it you took a long time to formula. yeah. It took a long time to get away from that. So cover crops are very important. We we do that too in conjunction with cover crops. Um, I'm seeing more and more people are beginning to either reintroduce the pumice from their wineries, uh -huh. which isn't a complete compost, but it's more, better than nothing. And a few are beginning to uh, also um, import compost. There are very few farms that are making their own compost. They are using a lot of foliar sprays. Yeah. They're not organic, but that, that trend is continuing to grow. And there's a handful of kind of microbial type products that also that a few farmers are adopting. So this is, and some, you know, some of them still use yeah. different forms of chemical fertilizer for fertility. So. David so just not. used the word uh, product. <laughs> that, that sends chills up and down my face. I will, will have these people that will call me up cold calls and they'll say, Mr. Preston, um, I'm in the so-and-so business, uh, agricultural amendments, whatever, and I have a product. The minute he uses that word product, I want to hang up and I usually do. Because it's, 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 synth it's typically synthetic and it isn't relevant to my farm and Somebody else is making a profit off of something that I could do myself. Um, as far as a foliar amendment, you can make tea out of this stuff, and we do. And we use it, uh, mostly we use it as a, as a mildew suppressant or competitive organism. And, mm -hmm. But just now we, there, we, had a, we have a strawberry bed that seemed to be lacking in oomph. And so we injected uh, uh, compost tea into the, the drip lines. Uh -huh. That's our, uh, our nutrition. Very well, this is uh, machine intensive. We don't have proper compost turning uh, equipment. We use a front end loader. Mm -hmm. So typically, if we're uh, if we're going to build a pile, Jesus, I think you should tell. How do we go about building a pile? What's the first thing we do, and, and what's your, what's the process? Well, we put in um, all cheap wheat, cheap wheat, all hammers from the vineyard. Grass from the pasture, cow manure. Then we start putting all together, mix it, and then if it rain, we don't have to water. But it's, this time we have to water a little bit to keep the moisture. But um, the winter time we don't have to water. Just turn twice a twice a week, mm -hmm. every three days for 15 days. And they start uh, numbering too much every week, the tent. So this is the most uh, mm -hmm. And we check the temperature. Every, every when we turn, we check the temperature in order to so, um, is there a range of temperature that you're like, oh, we need to turn this? Like it gets to a certain temperature and then like this is the time? Well, the yeah, almost um, 130, 140 mm -hmm. when it started. But sometimes they go more high. 170, but we start moving a uh, little right. more, not too high, uh -huh. to don't get it too much heat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so right. yeah. And how long is the process usually? Pardon me? How long is the whole process usually? Oops, Probably the most uh, 15 days, 20 days. Okay. With, for, when it's red. But that's not to complete breakdown, that's just to, to, to get through the, the, the fermentation. The, the it's interesting that there isn't uh, una unanimity of, of strategy or uh, philosophy or yeah. technique about this. If you talk to the health department, they want to kill pathogens. Yeah. The hotter mm -hmm. the better. Mm -hmm. And they'll tell you how many times per week to turn it and uh, uh, what minimum temperature you want to reach. Um, and, and they would be very happy if it were over 150 degrees with, uh, before it's yeah. finished. Uh, if you talk to um, the biodynamic people, they want to 
protect and preserve the, the organisms that are in the pile because that's part of the life of what that we're putting back out there. And if you get too hot, you're going to kill all that. So it's, there's a fine balance. You want to kill the pathogens, but you don't want to kill all the beneficial microorganisms. And um, uh, I, we have a, a biodynamic coach, a, a Frenchman, who has been in this country so long you'd think he'd lose his French accent, but that never, <laughs> never happens. And so you can barely understand it, but, but the, the, uh, the, the, the short, uh, long and the short of it is, is don't let it get hot, don't turn it, don't do anything, just let it be. And, and I, I kind of like that, just yeah. let it be, but we can't just let it be because we have all these other other uh, interested parties that are the telling us what to do. Other beings. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it obstructs a movement of, of fish in theory. There are no fish in here right now. This is a spawning stream. It's Pina Creek that flows into Dry Creek at the point of our, our property. And uh, I wanted you to see this part because this is what it looks like in its natural state. Um, what wonderful riparian uh, uh, growth on, on both sides. Uh, there, are, there are stretches of this creek that have been um, disturbed and worse over, over the years. We've done what we can to rebuild it. But what's kind of interesting, if, if you talk to people that are conservationists, they will really argue against confining creeks. Creeks should flood. Rivers should flood. Um, Brock, this is something you probably think about a lot. And, and uh, convincing property owners who have spent a lot of money to buy land and then are farming these uh, expensive crops like grapes, it's hard to convey to them the importance of, of the natural uh, intrusion of, of, uh, of a waterway onto the land. And, and David uh, can also uh, tell you some fascinating stories about some new thinking, which is floodplains have an incredibly positive impact on, on uh, native species. Of, in, in the case of uh, David's experience, it's a salmon. Um, there are all kinds of nutrients that are out there in the flooded fields. And if you don't allow the creek to flood, it's just pure water. It's not going to sustain life. So, um, uh, we do what we can to protect or restore the natural <coughs> riparian zone. And I wish it would flood. It, you, dry, dry Creek on the other side of the property used to flood before they built uh, Warm Springs Dam, and it, it never will again unless they take that damn dam down. <laughs> um, <coughs> so there, there went a major source of nutrition for our, for our property. This this uh, uh, this box oh. over here, it's a hacking box. Anybody know what a hacking box is? I'm a heckler, so. It's uh, the bird rescue people from Santa Rosa contacted me many years ago, and they said we have uh, we have some uh, some baby uh, baby owls. Would you be able to foster them for us oh. until they can until they mature and they can fly off? And we had never done that before. But uh, I said, yeah, sure, what do we do? And they said, well, we'll bring you a box. You need to mount it on a pole. And it had uh, a screen in the front. And um, <coughs> the, 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 the babies were about this big when we got them. And they grew to being about this, this big. They were incredible. And, and to take care of them, our job was to feed them. And they would provide us with bags of frozen mice. Mm. which we kept in the wine and <coughs> freezer. <laughs> and uh, so twice a day, one of us would come out here, climb a ladder, uh, open a hatch door in the back, and, and, and put the mice in there. And they, uh, it, it was just so interesting. And then uh, ultimately, uh, as they grew up, they were ready to fledge, and we opened it up, and they flew off. The hope was, of course, that they would sort of naturalize to this property and, and nest and... and uh, create new generations. Well, it didn't happen, but, mm -hmm. but it was a nice idea. Farming, in a way, is the easy part. It's, it's, it's integrating all of it into, into the farmscape, the landscape, the, the watershed, and uh, that's been my 
my, my passion and my goals over the time we've been here is to try to take what we what we do to run a practical business and, and have it become part of a holistic whole. Holistic whole, that's what we're going to <laughs> so, uh, one of our early diversifications was to introduce olives, and as I suggested earlier, it's before olive trees were fashionable uh, around the edges of vineyards. I, I was in a, I was visiting a, a, well, turns out a wine conference in, in Verona, Italy, and uh, I got bored with the wine side, and I discovered they had uh, some olive nursery uh, businesses that had uh, d displays at this conference, and so I went and chatted with them. And I, I knew that um, this area, being an Italian area, there were a lot of olive trees, sort of backyard olive trees, for for the uh, families to cure olives. And so, uh, in my halting Italian and their halting English, we figured out that there were some olive varieties that would work in Sonoma County. And so I bought these little plants. They were about this big kind of the size of a tomato start you buy at the nursery, mm -hmm. and carried them around for a couple of weeks and then carried on, them onto the airplane, <laughs> knowing that there was a good chance they would be confiscated at the airport coming home. So I went into the lavatory and I unpotted them, flushed the dirt down the <laughs> whatever, wherever it goes on airplanes, and put put all these little plants, there were just ten plants, put them in baggies and stuck them in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and, and walked in, Contraband. Uh, uh, went through the airport in New York or wherever it was. First thing I did is I went to find some place to buy some potting soil and, and potted them in some little coffee cups. And those that was the beginning of our, of our oil olive project. We grew those out until they were big enough to take uh, graftings from. Meanwhile, we had planted California sourced olives, which are the Mission and the Manzanillo, which have been sort of the foundation of the California oil business forever. And uh, and we planted uh, we planted out the uh, the California olives and grafted them over. And this is one of our first plantings on, on the, the hill here. And uh, there there are varieties that are then were rarely found in California. Our favorite is uh, Lechino, and there's Pendolino and Frantoio and Moriolo and all these things that now are fairly common, but uh, 20, 20, 25 years ago they weren't available. So it's what we call a suitcase import. <laughs> Better sense of what diversity means to us. It isn't relevant to every farm, but it's a, it's like they, they talk about um, under Earl Butts or whoever the Secretary of Agriculture was, it was get bigger, get out, Farm from fence row to fence row, da da da. da. You, you 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 see references to these things in, in history and textbooks, and we we need a new paradigm for farming. How can we farm sustainably, which means make a living on it, and not disrupt uh, the environment? Uh, there needs to be a balance. Uh, I've taken it o over the top to diversity. Maybe it's too far. That's just my personality. But uh, I think we can all all strive for for a balance of of species of of pests versus beneficials. And, and uh, you know, as we as we look at um, our hedgerows, where we're headed in that direction. One one of the things that organic farmers can do to ensure the health of, of, their, of their, the cash crops is to have habitat for the predator insects that will, that will predate on the, on the pests. And that, when, back when we were mostly growing grapes, that was hugely important because the, 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 uh, a monoculture of grapes is just feeding ground for pests. Mm -hmm. and, and you want to create some uh, uh, a, a, a counter um, counterbalance to that, and so um, we began to install hedgerows around vineyards, within vineyards. We took rows out in vineyards. We planted an annual uh, vegetable seeds in some of the vineyard rows. Anything we could do to create diversity, and I would say for the most part, it's been it's it's worked. It's the, the balance is reasonable, and it's. Uh, 
it makes your land so much more healthy overall. So, so we've had a neighbor, not this one, but we, we had a, well, one of our neighbors that was uh, finishing using Roundup in their vineyard, and they had some material left in their tank, and they thought they were doing me a favor. He ran a strip of, of herbicide right down my last row of vineyard. Yeah. And it was at that point we we began to install hedgerows. Uh -huh. so they couldn't do that anymore. Is it like that? Right. Well, when when uh, when you're certified organic, you have to um, you have to prove or you have to comply with the criteria of the CCOF, the California Certified Organic Farmers Group. And uh, in most cases, they're satisfied with a a bare strip that's not cultivated. But uh, that to me is um, it's pretty token, and it's, it, it certainly is not a barrier. Uh, it's just sort of a mental barrier, if anything. So, mm -hmm. so we, we went the extra mile of putting in plants that are an actual physical barrier. So, uh, except for this opening right here, it's, it would be unusual to get in enough drift to actually uh, get into it. Yeah. These, are, these are great people. One, one, of, uh, one of our episodes with the Maddens just uh, a couple of years ago, we, we graze sheep out here with electric fencing and some of the sheep got out and they got into the Madden's Vineyard and, and um, munched their way through uh, uh, about half a row or whatever. It cost me, it cost me a, 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 a lamb carcass and a case of wine. <laughs> it could have been a lot worse than that. Yeah. <laughs> This, this is uh, kind of a new deal. We've become grain growers. And I'll wait till they get here. But it's a, it's a spin off of learning to bake bread and wanting to have an estate loaf. Talk about estate mm -hmm. wines, we, uh, we like to grow what we bake them. That's awesome. So I, I wanted to stop here because this is another one of our alternate crops. Um, I was just mentioning uh, that we, uh, we've been baking uh, bread in the, uh, we, we have a brick oven, wood-fired oven in the, uh, in the tasting room kitchen and it's been a hobby of mine and, and an obsession of mine and over, over the years it's become part of our business. We bake bread for our visitors to the winery and we take some bread to the local farmers markets. It's not huge but it's, uh, it's, it's a, another expression of the land. Mm -hmm. Growing a nutritious food that can be made into an interesting uh, product. There's the word product. <laughs> so out here we, we have been experimenting for with quite a few years. We haven't totally settled on the, uh, the species or the varieties that uh, uh, we think work the best. Uh, what we're next to right here is spelt. I've never grown spelt before. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of a challenge. That we, it, it looks a little uh, uh, disturbed because we just mowed it. It was overwhelmed by, by uh, mustard, uh, wild mustard, which would uh, not only have shaded out the uh, the spelt, but our breads would taste spicy like mustard uh, because those little yeah. seeds uh, harvest just at, at about the same time as the, as the grain. Um, spelt is in the is a wheat variety that has uh, less gluten. It, uh, people are more tolerant to it than uh, to uh, to regular wheat. So we thought we'd give it a whirl. If anybody's interested in grains, there's an English woman that lives in Redwood City, Monica Spiller, who has, she with her husband, who's now passed, uh, has done research on heirloom grain varieties for at least a couple of decades. And uh, she's very influential in this, these new blossoming groups of artisan grain growers and bakers.
Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to restore a, a, a local um, uh, grain and bread industry in California or in the West Coast. It's very exciting. It's like the wine industry used to be 25, 30 years ago and more of uh, young people experimenting, um, nu nutrition focused, locally focused. Uh, it's, uh, I, I think it's going to become more and more important in the future as we try to build our food economies based on local appropriateness. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got spilt, we got rye. I love rye. Uh, it, it's, uh, it makes a very dense bread. It doesn't have the is issues that wheat does with gluten. And it's, it's very, very tasty. Very traditional, of course, in a European sense. The next one up, there's, uh, there's a, a wheat called Red Fife, which isn't a true heirloom, but it's, uh, uh, it's a hybrid of, a, of an early, early American wheat with, with some later work, but none of the genetic stuff. And then uh, the, the next one after that is another spelt. We have two different spelts. And um, uh, we're always excited to try these new things. We have no clue what, what it's going to turn out like. And uh, we've had challenges that are relevant to all of us as farmers. Do you plant it in the fall? We've done that. Too much rain, too cold. We got, uh, we got um, funguses growing. And uh, so we, we've had some instances where fall planting didn't work. Spring planting, we're a little behind. We weren't able to get into the field because of the heavy rains uh, this winter. So, so this, this rye should be bigger, taller, closer to maturity. When is it going to ripen? We don't know. I would say August. I would say September if we're lucky. Um, but it is what it is. And uh, if we can't harvest it, we'll graze it. Thank you. When you have a vineyard that's a perennial, it's like forever, right? Well, maybe not forever, but 30, 40 years, 100 years plus. And what, what if it isn't right? Or what if it doesn't fit your environment? Or what if it's pest prone, as Karen actually is? Or uh, or the market isn't there for it, or whatever. Well, it's it's actually fairly simple to convert from one variety to another. And we walked past a block that had been Morvedra, and now it's uh, Roussan, because we wanted more white in our own program. Uh, we have grown Zinfandel in areas that were not Zinfandel appropriate and converted it to Syrah. So that's one of the tools in our toolbox is, is um, uh, a grafting over um, to kind of stay current with either your personal tastes or with, with the market. Um, it is a stretch to call that diversity or rotation, but yeah. Have and, you done that with olive trees as well, converted whole blocks? Actually, we haven't, and what we feel about olives is that the character of your oil isn't, isn't based on the variety necessarily it's based on your culture of that variety. Uh, when you when you pick it how, how you work with it um, we, we we have these California mission varieties we've got Italian oil varieties it all ends up in the same the same oil tank the same oil the same bottle it's beautiful stuff and uh, you know who would have thought that that mission uh, olives would give you a fine oil, but it can. Uh, and part of that is our, our microclimate or our, our macroclimate in this area. It's great here for olives. Yeah. So we haven't paid that much attention to varieties for oil. Cured olives is a different story. Right. But we, it, converting a tree is a bigger deal. Mm -hmm. And you can really harm a tree by making good cuts. Yeah. So, um, what we have here is the, the, the other uh, aspect of diversity, which is species diversity, animals. You've seen the chickens. Uh, ideally, we, we, we set up to follow the, the model of Alan Savory, uh, holistic management, uh, emulating um, wildlife on the savanna, the uh, upper plains, whatever. We found it's very difficult to, to, to keep that model working. Ideally, we'd have the sheep would go first and graze, and then the chickens would follow behind. 
you sort of have sequential species of it. Uh, what we're looking at is sort of um, you're covering from a, a, a from an unusual winter. We got way too much uh, grass growth, and it's kind of overwhelmed a lot of our pastures, and we're we're still catching up with managing it. But still, we're we're, we're grazing and then following with a the mower so we can get back to new growth uh, coming up. These are pasture grasses that we planted, uh, a mix uh, that's recommended for irrigated pasture for livestock. Um, our, our, our crop, we're, we're in the, the final stages of deciding what is a, a better uh, number of animals. We, we don't have enough now to eat fast enough. Mm -hmm. So we'll be bringing in some more ewes. We just introduced uh, a, a ram to the, the girls so that we'll begin the next breeding cycle. It's about five months, so um, come back uh, early winter, let's see, July, August, September, October. <laughs> How about late November, early December? Thanksgiving. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, um, you know, we're, we're not animal um, people. We're learning. This is, it's been quite a few years, but we're still learning. And, but we, we feel, um, we feel that animals on the property are really important. It, it, uh, it, it, there's an ecological change that happens when you have animals along with your crops, along with your wild areas, and uh, it's uh, it's partly the, the nutrition. It's, it, it just it feels right, and I can't describe what it is. It's magic having mm -hmm. animals, and it's another crop. Uh, we sell uh, our meat to local chefs. Uh, they they love the. Um, the, the fat marbling that we get with our lamb, and, and uh, we, we do some on-ranch slaughter, and it's another way of bringing people to the property to enjoy all of our different products along with uh, the environment. So anyway, um, we're learning and it tastes good. Um, what we have in this, th this is another one of our mixed uh, pasture areas. We have uh, walnuts. We, we've got walnuts in other places on the property. We've begun a practice here of transplanting walnut, black walnut seedlings from the creek area where we were earlier down below. And we grow it out uh, for uh, enough years that the trunk develops some height, and then we graft it over to um, English walnut. The, the thing about growing the trunk up to a certain height, the old timers were pretty smart, and they knew that when a walnut tree died, they would have this beautiful trunk of black walnut lumber, which was highly valued for furniture and gun stocks and all that. So we're following that old pattern. Jesus is our grafter. And uh, you want to tell us about grafting walnuts? It's it's hard, right? Yeah, this is a more hard uh, grafting tree because it, we have to climb in the, a ladder. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I tried to for three years. And I finally uh, some catch now uh, the grafter, but this is still not. So we let him go this Saturday to grab the egg here. But some is still already grafting, producing some. I got one. That one. Yeah, only uh, I think it's about twelve already that catching. Tilt? Yeah, okay. but I have about four or five. We have to graft the next yeah. mm. you know, We also have chestnuts uh, out here. Yeah. Part of the reason for having trees is it gives shade for the animals. Mm -hmm. And it's another another crop to take to the farmer's market. People love the, uh, having having different things to eat different times of the year. Uh, walnuts are, are dried. We sun dry them. And so they keep uh, uh, for the whole year if you, if you don't sell through them. Uh, the chestnuts, I always thought chestnuts were just another nut that you dry, but it's a, it's a fresh, it's, it's better handled like a fruit to keep it refrigerated. Hmm. And uh, so the, uh, the chestnut crop is a quick turnover. Harvest it, take it to the market, sell it, and it's, it's done.
when I started this in 1970 and this, uh, 1969, and my goal was to see people get access to food of all economic status. Mm -hmm. The organic industry has gone parallel, uh, opposite direction. And uh, it's almost impossible unless you're wealthy to eat organic. And to go to some place like Single Thread and spend $400 for dinner yeah. is only for wealthy people. Yeah. Uh, and the important thing is that people need to make a living, the farmers and the farm workers. But uh, we need to figure out a system that actually brings food back to the commoners. And my kids are all in their 30s and 40s, and they, the kids, and they constantly are in the dilemma how to feed them well mm -hmm. on a regular working person's income. So I, I want to urge everybody to think about that when you get into this. It's, yeah, you got to pay yourself well, but also who's your audience. Yeah. And if you're going to single thread, if that's your audience, it's not really a sustainable audience. Hmm. Uh, I mean, it's great that they can come here and do hedgerow harvest, because that puts something that normally doesn't go to use to use, hmm. and, and an educational part. But we also have to look at how we can actually feed people. You know, organic farming is about 1% of our production in the United States. That means 99% of it's still the same old, same old. Right. And the growth in organic products is almost all from imported materials. Mm -hmm. So if you're really talking about the issue of sustainability and environmental awareness, you know, we've got to figure out how to make it sustainable for us and get more people doing this and at the same time bring food to people at a reasonable price. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not an easy thing. I, I struggle with it all the time in our project. but. It, it is that, you know, I went to Single Thread. Oh. I was grateful. Somebody bought me dinner. Mm. But at the same time, I was like, <laughs> if this is the model, yeah. then we're, we're heading down a model I'm not comfortable with. Yeah. I'm really glad they're buying stuff out of the hedgerow yeah. you know, yeah. from other farmers. And that's the good thing is they are supporting a lot of local mm -hmm. farmers. Mm -hmm. Right. It's really important. And probably paying them well. And paying them decent. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's the upside. But we've got to get it into the regular grocery, or regular restaurants as well. Mm -hmm. And there are. There's definitely more of that. But I, I've always felt that local farmers markets are really important both to the farmer and to the community. Uh, and it's a struggle. I'm on the board of our local Healdsburg uh, farmers market, and people come to kind of kick the tires and to, and to chitty chat and to walk around and and uh, buy silly stuff. But they're still shopping at, at Safeway and at the other uh, big stores, and w we're struggling with what the answer is. It has something to do about building community. Yeah. It, it's. Uh, it's not just food, it's, it's nutrition for the, for the being, for your mind, for your, for your, your whole body. And um, there's, you think of a marketplace in, in Europe, it's a daily occurrence. You're going there to be part of your town, part of your community, and to get your food. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not a, an American pattern. I think it could be. Um, I think it should be, but you know, we don't really know how to get there. And uh, it's really hard to um, put your finger on exactly what that means. But the background here, uh, this property, which is not ours, the one we just came from, which is ours, where we're headed on the other side of the creek, all belong to a family descended from one of the, the prime pioneers of Dr. Valley. His name is Phillips, Diddy Phillips. And I don't know if he was awarded a grant from, uh, uh, from the, the Spanish government of the time in the 1800s. But this, I'm not sure of the vintage of, of this house. It's probably, it could be the last decade of the, of the 1800s. Yeah. Probably more recent than that. My house up the road was 1895. Uh, the house beyond that is another 1890s, whatever. So there's, there's a history here. And uh, something that, that uh, concerns me or bothers me is that as newcomers into the, come into the valley, as here, you just bought it, this, this history is lost. And I keep wondering, is there some way that we can preserve the culture and the history of this area as this farming area? Mm. We talked a little bit about can we, can we honor the, the, the native uh, uh, background of this area? I think we can. There's a lot of learning we need to do. Um, the, uh, we have a very active museum in town, and we, we know the, uh, the, the, the curator, the, uh, the manager of the museum, and she's very into food and, and uh, I mean food history. And there's something uh, that, that I would very much 
like to encourage and support is developing the history because I think it's relevant to what we all do. It's not like we're reinventing anything. Mm -hmm. We're finding the best, we're finding what works, and we're finding what's locally appropriate. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's been kind of something that I care about and I'd like to kind of pass on that, that thought. Uh, Evan Wee? No, Evan Engberman. Evan Engberg. Evan Engberg. Oh. Uh, yeah, right there. This is it's Pina Creek. It's, a, it's an area where in the, the old days, as the, uh, uh, my old-timer mentors would say, you could walk across uh, Pina Creek on the backs of the salmon. Uh, could that have been an exaggeration? Well, maybe. But it, it ain't like that today. And we've, we've really, we've lost a lot. And the things that we clever Americans have done to mitigate the damage are just as harmful. We yeah. put, we build a dam upstream and build a hatchery at the foot of the dam. Mm. So the species that are now being released into the stream are uh, are not wild domestic uh, species. I mean, they're not wild species. They've they've changed, and so the the populations continue to decline, and uh, despite uh, efforts of our government, now we got involved in some efforts. Uh, it's at least 20 years ago. Um, we were approached by the Fish and Game uh, to uh, restore the riparian growth along the banks of the creek. The idea here is to uh, encourage deepening of the channel, although that goes against the idea of flooding, deepening of the channel and the growth of shade trees along the side that would, would uh, give the, uh, the migrating salmon a resting spot, uh, cooler waters, and uh, uh, hopefully en enhance the, uh, the, the spawning and the regeneration of the species. This whole area was just, just a gravel bed. There was no vegetation on it. Wow. And it took, so, you know, stabilizing the creek banks a little bit and then introducing uh, 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 the shade throwing plants, uh, willows first and then and then cottonwoods and, and then understory plants. And, and, and now it's, it's approaching a community of plants. Mm -hmm. It's taken a lot of years to do that. <clears throat> there used to be that people would come onto the property with their Jeeps, they'd do a U-turn here and, and head up the creek. They can't do it anymore. Oh, wow. 